Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 712. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 14, 2022. All right, welcome to another program. We're glad you could join us, and we just want you to know how thankful we are, Kevin and George, for you guys showing up twice a week to watch Anglican Scripted. We know this show would be nothing without you, and we are very humbled that you come here every week to watch us, and I just want to say thank you up front. Um, and if you really, really, really like us, click that like button. George, how are you doing this week? Nervous. Susan and I go to the title company this afternoon with a certified check to make the down payment on the home we've we've just purchased. We signed a contract on the home we've been living in for the past few years. Mm -hmm. uh, the landlord sold it to us. It's the first home we've purchased since 1987. When wow. Susan and I were first married, we bought our first home in Pennsylvania. We still own it. And all these years, as we've been moving around the country, we've been renting because we never quite know how long we're going to be in a place. Well, we've decided we've found our forever home here in beautiful Florida where we've been living. And so I'm now going to be a homeowner and uh, I can now complain about taxes and the neighbors and all these <laughs> and the POAs, you, you, the property association. Oh, <laughs> oh, they get, I got, you know. I got this thing. I thought, what is this? The tax code, or uh, it this, this several hundred page book on all the different colors you can paint your house. What you can't do, you can't ha you can't use red mulch. You can only have these three shades. You can only have these two roofing materials. All the setbacks and the rules about Christmas decorations and all this fun stuff. And uh, don't know how strict they are about the rules, but. Uh, Certainly, some people with a lot of time on their hands have been writing these regulations. You no, know, they're Pharisees. The Pharisees have existed in every generation, and they end up on housing association boards and property association boards. Here in the the place we live is a property association as well, and there's lots of rules. Everybody here has the same color uh, mini house, a little suite, has yellow on the siding. It has tin steel for the roof has white for the uh, uh, windowsills, and that's what you get. If you want to stand out, it's your RV that stands out. And, you know, I read that I'm not allowed to keep chickens, pigs, uh, cattle. Uh, well, the, the, <laughs> they're so the, specific, they list all the... <laughs> now, it didn't say ferrets, so if I want to start a ferret farm, I think good. I can start a ferret farm. But uh, it's just fun watching all this. Well, uh, the key to a good Florida homeownership is, are you able to fix your car on the front lawn? Driveway. Driveway. The lawn. The lawn uh, you can always power wash the driveway. You can't power wash the lawn. you got to put new sod down. Oh, boy. All right. So let's oh. get off to the news here. Um, good news story. Uh, we put up an atlas picture of China's religious landscape. And China is officially a uh, atheist country. Uh, the government says, if you want to worship anybody, worship our leader, worship our party. But for Pete's sake, never worship uh, any of the religions out there or gods out there. And so, uh, George, let's talk about this uh, little picture of China we have with all the different colors where we talk about all these Christian enclaves. The color scheme, if you're viewing it from home, if you can't, if you're listening to the podcast, I'll describe it to you. We've got a variety of colors. Green represents areas that are predominantly Islamic, where the majority of the population identify as Muslim. That, of course, is uh, uh, Xinjiang, the far west. And then there are pockets in northern China and uh, across China. Then we have orange, which is Buddhist. And, of course, Tibet and great swathes of southern China and northern China as well are Buddhist. Then we have red and purple. Those are Christian. Red is Protestant, purple is Roman Catholic. And if you look at the map, you would say, oh, well, it's majority Buddhist. Well, those are the uninhabited wastes of, uh, of uh, Tibet. Yeah. Or, oh, it's mostly 
green. Well, those are the de that's the Gobi Desert. It's Peking, Shanghai, uh, North Manchuria are predominantly Protestant. And then you see areas that are predominantly Roman Catholic. Now, the white areas are the areas that they have no information. And then you have the no religion. And the no religion are actually one of the fewer blocks. Uh, you'll see, see the very top up in the northern Manchuria, uh, along the Russian border, uh, between uh, Xinjiang and Tibet. But what is remarkable is if you did a similar map of England, I think the no, major, no religion would be yeah. the largest group. Um, the, 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 what is this telling us? Well, even though the government in China is, is sharply cracking down on religion, Christianity and Islam, right now it's really nasty to Islam, uh, but not to all Muslims. It's the, it's the Muslims in the Western China, in, uh, the Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. The Hui Muslims, who are Chinese, Han Chinese, that's the same group as same uh, tribal group, racial group as other Chinese, the majority, they're not being picked upon. It's the Uyghurs, who are Turkic people in the West. But Han Christians, Han Muslims, are under a great deal of pressure. They're seeing their mosques closed, their churches closed, uh, discrimination in the workplace. Yet the church, especially the Protestant church, is growing in leaps and bounds. Now compare that to the United States and to England. The United States, the Pew Research Foundation, Pew people, just did a survey and they found that church attendance is declining. And this was pre-COVID. And church identification was declining. But church identification was declining faster than church attendance was. And what this tells us is that people who went to church basically because it was the social thing to do, they're realtors who want to get business, they don't need to do that anymore. But the church as a whole is pretty healthy. And one of the things, they, one of the little tidbits I took away was that 90% of all Americans, all Americans, people with no religion, Jews, Muslims, Christians, whoever, 90% believe that Jesus was a real person. Mm -hmm. They may not accept him as God, but they ninety percent of Americans say Jesus was a real human being. Well, they, they now, believe in a historical Jesus. They may not Jesus. They don't understand the miracles or the resurrection or believe in all that, but they do understand that he was a real person in real time. Compare that to England. England, the Average Sunday attendance of the Church of England is hovering around 2% of mm -hmm. the population. And 60% of English believe that Jesus was a real person. 40% believe he was a myth. Now, that's a harder number to overcome. Uh, if you begin with the proposition that Jesus was real, I just don't know if I believe all these miracles. That's an easier sell than... Jesus is a myth, it was made up, and all this is nonsense. So America is fast, is, is diverging faster and faster and faster from Europe and England on the question of faith, where agnosticism really is moving into a functional atheism, where, you know, these are all pretty stories that I like to hear and I like to go to church basically for entertainment, but Jesus is a real person, you know, owes me and made me, that's receding in England. And well, that's frightening, I think. The problem with England and much of Europe is the church is leading the front in uh, deconstructing Jesus. You know, they're there mm -hmm. trying to tell you, well, you know, if you don't believe in the resurrection, that's fine, you can still be a Christian. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, don't worry, you can still be a Christian. If you don't, you, you just pick across the whole Nicene Creed, and it's not really something that the Church of England and many of the churches in England are protecting or being creedal mm -hmm. about. And if the society doesn't see the church or society protecting it, what's the, what's the point of being uh, a Christian? And that's what we're finding in Europe, George. Well, there's an adage in the United States, uh, get woke, go broke. Uh, companies and institutions that uh, 
pursue the woke agenda almost always have uh, lost membership, lost relevance, lost importance. Mm -hmm. Those churches that have kept to the main thing, Jesus Christ, have done quite well, continue to do well. Even Episcopal churches that focus on Jesus Christ as the main thing, my little church here in rural Florida, are doing very well, thank you. It's those churches that seem to be want to pursue relevance, that want to be the church of what's happening now, that want to be the church that the smart people, the, the elites think is relevant. Those churches are dying. Um, I keep reading these things that the Episcopal Church is going to basically disappear and will only be found in suburban and urban areas. Kevin, you and I live in what was called rural areas, rural Florida, <laughs> uh, where where the we get excited AC, when the, they, yeah. Well, when, when they open the uh, Culver's ice cream in about a month here in Inverness, that'll be a big deal. Sure. Uh, because we live in rural Florida. Yet the church, the Episcopal church, is growing. Why is that? And I think, and the Presbyterian church here in town, the good old Presbyterian Church of America, which is actually collapsing at a faster rate than the Episcopal church is growing here in my little town of Lacanto. Why is that? That because we focus on the saving grace of Jesus Christ, not on mosquito nets, not on gender and justice issues. Um, you know, when Michael Curry, the presiding bishop, gave a speech on Epiphany, uh, January 6th, his speech was not about the Epiphany, but it was about the riots in Washington, D.C. And he didn't really say anything about the epiphany. And friends, why do you need Michael Curry to add to the voices that you can already listen to on CNN or MSNBC telling you how terrible America is in these riots? Um, people tune it out. They do. Whereas well, and you, and but, they do. Uh, CNN has lost 90% of their audience since Trump has left office. At, at a certain point, <laughs> Anglican Unscripted will have more audience than CNN. If that can, that trend continues, and what we're well, seeing... let, let go ahead. Can I can I put it? MSNBC has lost sixty seven percent of its audience, mm -hmm. so that if we if we get three thousand viewers of uh, of this episode, but when it's all said and done, MSNBC's Rachel Maddow show will have eighty three thousand. That's not really that far apart. No, it's not. Okay? <laughs> now, yes, it's 80,000 more, but uh, Fox News is in the two to 300,000 mm -hmm. range. So, at a certain... Now, of course, the smart people, the fashionable people, the New York elites may not be tuning into uh, every single one of Anglican Unscripted episodes. Probably not. But... But it just shows you that the relevance of uh, Get Woke, Go Broke, uh, you can see it at work in the world. Yeah. All right. Look, we have, uh, let me pull up my news stories here. Another story to talk about. I lost my scripts. So there they are. Uh, next story. Oh, let's go to England. We always go to England for our next story. Then we'll hit the Bishop of Nairobi in Rwanda. So, George, uh, there were some climate protesters over in England, and they were able to convince a jury that it's the only way they could get their message out was to uh, disrupt train service. And um, if you go down that, that path too far, um, it, it leads to dangerous things. So let's talk a little bit about that story. The Shadwell Three mm -hmm. is the newspaper shorthand for three elderly people one in the radies, an uh, Anglican minister in her 70s, and a Catholic priest in his 50s. Uh, about, I think in 2019, basically disrupted commuter rail service in the Docklands Light Railway, hopping on top of the uh, of, a, of a commuter train in, at the Shadwell station, while 10 of their friends sort of kept people off the train on the platform. And they did this to protest climate change. Well, they were arrested for disturbing the peace and creating mischief and 
for having disrupted train service on a work day for an hour and a half, 77 minutes. They, they demanded a jury trial. And essentially we saw what we call in the United States jury nullification. These people were guilty. Mm -hmm. But they bought the defendant's uh, argument that this was the only way they could bring to attention to people the problem of climate change. This follows about 10 days ago in Bristol, the statue of a slave trader named Colston, one of the benefactors of Bristol, was tossed into the harbor by a mob and the people who were arrested for doing this uh, vandalism were acquitted because they too, the only way they could protest and make their voices heard, according to the jury verdict, was to destroy public, to destroy property. Well, George, uh, I, in, I, I'm very pro-life. Can, can I use this as a, an excuse to uh, use violence as well? No, see, there are, two, there are two standards here. If you attempt to harass or picket an abortion clinic in the UK, if you even have a sign that is slightly distasteful posted across the street on a billboard that you rent, you can be arrested and harassed. If you complain, uh, if your name is Tommy Robinson and you complain about uh, uh, grooming gangs in Rotherham and other northern English towns, you will be arrested uh, and you will be jailed and you will be vilified. But if you support a left-leaning cause, the, the legal system will basically excuse this. Well, but the, but the excuse in, was, in the, the excuse was this is the only way I can get the message out. The judge in the Shadwell case, if you read his jury instructions, he basically gave the jury carte blanche to disregard the law in citing the European Convention on Human Rights saying people have the right to protest and do you believe it is worth jailing these people for exercising their civic right to protest? Forgetting the fact that they were violating other laws that brought inconvenience to other people. And now, is this an effective way to bring people's attention? No, it's not. In the 70s and 80s, we had probably the same people. They're not just in their 80s. <laughs> what, what, the underground, the Sandinista. I mean, we had a lot of trouble here in America, yes. And in England, we had these crazy women, you know, go to go to the U.S. Air Base, what was it, Grenon Common, yeah. um, where we had nuclear weapons stored. Mm -hmm. We don't admit or deny there were nuclear <laughs> weapons. And, you know, chain themselves to the fence. Uh, we had uh, the Berrigan, was it Daniel or Philip Berrigan, and crazy Catholic nuns in the United States break into nuclear weapons facilities and then chain themselves to the fence to protest the neutron bomb and all this mm -hmm. and that. And all it did was uh, waste government money to prosecute them and waste the protesters money to defend them in public and public opinion was not swayed in fact public opinion was like oh god these people are such loons and it did not in any way bring credit to the christian faith these people are basically saying we do this because of our christian conviction calls us to destroy property i'm sorry and they liken it to jesus overturning the money changers uh tables at the temple well, I'm sorry, the Docklands Light Railway is not the temple of God in Jerusalem. Well, here it's in America, a suburban commuter train station. the Constitution calls us for, we're allowed to have peaceful assembly. You know, we, th there's no law that says we can have violent protest. And the rule of law is if you break something, you're held accountable for it. But you are allowed to have peaceful assembly. Uh, the, the, nobody can stop you from gathering together for whatever cause you want to have peacefully. The Shadwell Three pleaded not guilty. Mm -hmm. They did not want to stand and be punished for their convictions. Com compare this to the civil rights, the early civil rights movements, mm -hmm. who yeah. pled guilty to obstruction of justice, to sitting at a lunch counter and blocking traffic. Mm -hmm. They they were willing to take the penalty for their actions as a sign of protest. In this modern world, these people tried to uh, 
evoke the image of past civil rights protests, but they refuse to accept the consequences for their actions the way their way forebears did in protest movements in the past. Well, this is I, childishness carried out by old farts. The biggest change in the last 10 years, maybe 20 years, is being offended is now a virtue. If mm -hmm. I've been offended by, if I have offended somebody, they are now the virtuous one in the argument or the discussion. And that, you know, sadly that can't stand as, a, as any reason or, or rational thought. Uh, however, that's what's happening here, certainly in America, over wokeism and uh, critical race theory. And we're seeing that more and more with these protesters. It's the only way I can get my message across is to do violent confrontation. Well, great. Well, at least be held accountable for it. Um, don't just burn down a town well, and not go to jail. And, the, and it's not just England where the justice system is now being skewed against personal liberties and private property. It's the United States. We have these people arrested in the wake of the January 6th protests, and they've been held without trial, without bail for almost a year now, over a year. Mm -hmm. But we've had eight instances of Antifa terrorists invading government property in Washington, D.C., and across the country, invading the Senate office building, invading different you know, Department of Justice and whatnot, released immediately on jail. Uh, on bail and given suspended sentences of less than three months well the, if people the, remember the justice system when brent kavanaugh was uh, nominated to be to the supreme court uh antifa the women's movement and all that occupied the house and uh, the and the offices of nancy pelosi they were in there and they wouldn't leave mm -hmm. they're not in jail they weren't prosecuted no, and there were and there were as many armed people in that crowd as there were in the January 6th protests. That's true. What we've here's one of the things we've we've been discovering right now, for those uh, from outside the United States who haven't been really been following the news, with an attention to fact rather than opinion. Um, and if you if all you know is what you read in the BBC and the Guardian, you really don't know what's going on. That's true. Those who die. Those who die. Two uh. Two of those who died were killed by the police. Mm -hmm. One was shot to death, the other was beaten to death. Officer Sicknick, the policeman who died uh, shortly after the conflict, who was given, who was allowed, whose funeral was held in state in the rotunda of the Congress, suffered a stroke. And it was reported that he was not, he was protesters, one of whom was an army medic, attempted to assist him but was handcuffed and was told to sit down and shut up and he sat and watched Sicknick who had an obvious stroke wait for seven hours before he was evacuated for medical care who killed officer Sicknick a stroke killed him but the inattention of his police comrades killed him and the other person who died died of a heart attack after the police threw a stun grenade Everyone who died died because of police action or incompetence in the January 6th uh, incident. How do we know all this? We know this from court testimony. So government documents. documents. We don't know this courts. through the press. Government documentation. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know this through the press. We mm -hmm. know it through the release of documentation. Mm -hmm. Will we hear this in the January 6th committee at the Congress? I doubt it. I mean, but, it, it's but, the press is it, really failing uh, us in the West. Uh, we mm -hmm. are not getting any straight fact reporting about what happens in our government. Everything is so one-sided, so slanted. And we're seeing this now where um, there is no neutral ground. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very disappointing Ooh. as a journalist to watch this happen at the the national level where there's just the the bias is almost demonic uh, mm -hmm. as we watch this happening 
and there's and folks there's nothing new under the sun we saw this happen in america when andrew jackson was elected as president mm -hmm. when he was elected to president his supporters who were trying to overthrow the elitists though the wealthy the the great landowners the established merchants the backwoods farmers the small you know the small uh small holding uh farmers the tradesmen they backed Andrew Jackson against the elites. And when he was elected, they mobbed the White House because it was now their house. And you have the same sort of thing that happened on January 6th, except the army and the National Guard at that time didn't intervene you know, physically. And then you had the elites, including all the newspapers, work and, and vilify Jackson. So he lost his next election, but then he came back and won a second time. And it's the same insider versus outsider. We call it the, the revolution of 18, was it 24? Yeah, something like that. Whatever it was. Yeah. But the, the point is, this is a pattern in American history. And whether you like Trump or not, and we're not pro-Trump or anti-Trump on this show, Kevin has voiced his strong reservations about Donald Trump on many occasions. Um, what we're seeing is that Trump, just as Andrew Jackson did, represented a populist revolt against the establishment. And now we have an establishment that is dispensing two types of justice in the United States. And we have, it's the same, and, you know, the rumblings are, are so loud right now. Um, it's one of the reasons why people are moving to Florida from New York State, uh, from the Northeast, from Illinois, and people are moving to Texas from California. Well, I, I think they're, they're tired of the witch hunts. Right now, the cancel culture is just conducting witch hunts via Twitter, via social media, via uh, journalism, where if you don't think the way you're supposed to think, it's not just your actions anymore. If you don't think the way you're supposed to think, uh, according to the zeitgeist, you will be canceled. And it's like a witch trial. You know, they point to you, witch, 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 witch. And <laughs> the witches had trials. There's no trial here for the cancel culture. If they discover you're not woke, uh, you're doomed and you will be canceled. Now, there's been, thankfully, in the last eight months, a lot of pushback to that. But uh, not enough, certainly within the church realm. Uh, the, the church has not done enough to to weed out the, the woke heresy that's uh, slowly, you know, encapsulating the evangelical church here in America. We'll have to see what happens long term, but it, it's hard to watch as a journalist, George. Uh, we have other stories we do need to cover. Uh, fun, <laughs> that, stories, fun, fun stories. Fun stories. No, no. Fish sex crimes. Se and this is it. This is going to be a sex crime story. Um, we've talked about the Bishop of Nairobi before um, as being somebody lifted up to be influential in the ACC, ACC? Yeah, um, and other places. He uh, got himself invited to one of the uh, conferences in Lusaka. Lusaka? What was that? Let's, Lusaka, yeah. My, my pronunciation sometimes, George. Lusaka, and we need to talk about it because he's not the person who the Anglican communion thought he was. George, bring us up to date. Some in the Anglican communion are surprised. In 2015, Eliud Wabakula was the Archbishop of Kenya. Mm -hmm. He was one of the influential stalwarts leaders of the GAFCON movement. There was going to be an Anglican Consultative Council meeting in Lusaka, Zambia in 2016. Earlier in 2015, there had been a primates meeting, and at that primates meeting, it was said the Americans cannot be on any uh, leadership position in the Anglican world. And Wabakula protested because Americans were on the standing committee of the Anglican Consultative Council, at that time, Bishop of Connecticut, Ian uh, Douglas. Mm -hmm. Well, Wabakula went on a parochial visit up country to northern Kenya, and the Bishop of Nairobi, with the support of Lamb Palace, went and to the national headquarters and told the, the people there that he was going 
to the Lusaka meeting as a representative of the Anglican Church of Kenya. And he told the other two people who had been elected by the province that they would now come with him. And he told and them that he, he had the permission of Iliad Wabakua. And he gave them a document with Wabakula's signature on it. Mm -hmm. Wabakula comes back and says, my signature has been forged. And what Waweru, Joel Waweru, the Bishop of Nairobi had done, what photocopied uh, a document, snipped out the signature and placed it on a letter, which he then photocopied, purporting to be permission. Well, we brought this to the attention and Kevin and I had a phone call with Joel, Eliud Wabakula, which Kevin recorded, where Eliud Wabakula discussed the forging, forging of his name and the false participation of Joel Waweru in the Lusaka ACC meeting. For that, uh, Josiah Dawu Faron took to the air calling Kevin and I satanic, spreading evil and terrible lies about Joel Waweru. And for his troubles, Joel Waweru was elected to the Standing Committee of the Anglican Consultative Council. He was appointed the Anglican representative to the Roman Catholic Synod on the Family. And he has been the leading voice in Kenya for the Anglican bishops to come to Lambeth. So this is not a clean guy. Well, on Wednesday of this week, Joel Waweru stood before a magistrate in Nairobi accused of sexually assaulting a female member of his clergy. An attractive younger female priest, he promoted to be vicar of a very nice parish in Nairobi. And then he proceeded to try to seduce, you know, yes. I mean, this could be out of a, a 50s, you know, boss trying to <laughs> sexually <Madman>. harass. <laughs> a, yes, a madman scenario. Yes, yeah. And he came in and he, you know, attempted to he squeezed her bosom, she states in the complaint and tried to kiss him and his wife walked in and his wife closed her eyes and walked out. And he did this for like a year and a half, two years, and she complained and she complained to the Kenyan church. Well, well, where allies forbade and blocked any investigation into his misconduct? So with the approval and support of the archbishop, she went to the police. And a police investigation found probable cause to arrest the Bishop of Nairobi for two counts of sexual assault. And he appeared at a magistrate's court on Wednesday, pled not guilty, uh, and was bailed out. And in two weeks' time, he goes for his first hearing. Now, Jackson Oli Sapit has been criticized because his province is GAFCON, but it has two women bishops now. And he was supposed to block that. He couldn't because he didn't have the majority of his bishops on side because Waweru has been leading the opposition. Waweru wants to be archbishop. Waweru wants to get the money from New York that flows into the uh, docile Kenyan diocese. Waweru plays the tribe card. Jackson Oli Sapit is a Maasai. Uh, Joel Waweru is a Kikuyu, and the Kikuyu are the largest tribe based around Mount Kenya. And the it's all the bad old days of corruption and tribalism. And this is the man that Lambeth Palace and the ACC have been promoting as our man in Africa. And now he's facing two counts of sexual assault. Now, he's not been convicted. Not been it's, convicted. This one, more, this one priest pointed out that when she rebuffed his assaults, she was had her pay cut and demoted from her nice parish, lost the title of archdeacon, and was reassigned to a crappy parish on the outskirts of the diocese in retribution for her failing to uh, respond appropriately to the bishop's sexual advantages. Madman, yes. I mean, it's sad that that, you know, the, that culture uh, still exists in the West and in Africa and the East, but uh hopefully uh this goes to trial and uh we have a verdict well we have a similar case in india uh that's been very very popular in the indian press there franco malakal as bishop of jahalabar in south kerala was arrested for raping a nun 
evidently every time he visited this convent of which he was the Episcopal visitor, he would single out this one particular nun and would rape her. And the convent complained to the Catholic Church in India, and they said, well, you, a bishop would never do this. We don't want to hear this. And so they went to the, they went to the Vatican. The Vatican did nothing about it. And so they went to the police. And the police brought this man up on charges. And this morning, January 14th in, uh, in uh, Kerala, the uh, a judge found him not guilty because there wasn't sufficient evidence. It was a he said, she said case. And the nuns and the prosecutor have vowed to appeal the judge's ruling. And part of this is, is that it's the culture in many parts of the world that women are not equal to men. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're not talking about the women priests issue. No, we're talking about women are, no. we're yeah. not talking about that. What we're yeah. talking about is that, uh, women it's the same line of thinking that if a woman wears a provocative skirt that means she wants to be raped she mm -hmm. was asking for it okay. that uh women are we're talking about objects. the issues that surrounded uh, first second wave feminism you know that uh, we're yeah. not objects we're not property and that's the discussion that needs to really happen in places like india uh, many uh, countries in Africa. Parts of Africa, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, that discussion's and, been had here, and there's been, been great strives uh, in many different areas of education and the professional work life where uh, there is finally some nice equal treatment. So, Culture in Asia, China, the culture in India, the culture in many parts of Africa, the culture in South America is anti-woman in the sense of women are not believed women can be assaulted women mm -hmm. can you know she deserved it it's the machismo culture which uh i'm not some weenie beanie uh feminist here but i'm talking about well, I'm a father of daughters uh as is kevin we, we both have two daughters of, we both have two girls yeah. uh who have bled us dry financially <laughs> no mine have uh but what, what I'm saying is that, you know, this is part of the Christian ethos that you mm -hmm. can, Joel Oweru is right on the gay issue. Mm -hmm. He is. Uh, he, at ACC meetings, he's had uh, knockdown, drag out fights with the American rep, the former bishop from, the now retired Episcopal bishop from Oklahoma, Ed Kosciuszki, Kosecki, whatever Kisaki, it is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can be right on some of these issues. But at the same time, you can not be a model of what a good bishop should be, and you could be a false Christian. In well, other one, words, of the, one of the problems we find is there's no consistent good leadership in some of these African churches. And we, we saw the news that Rwanda wants to keep their archbishop uh, for another couple of years because he's offered such consistent good leadership. And we should talk a little about that. That strive for we got somebody we want to keep him. Um, he's certainly pro Gafcon. Uh, he's helped uh, uh, stabilize Rwanda. He's helped make the the church more fiscally responsible and helped uh, build the church. Cool. The how, there was a special meeting in the House of Bishops uh, last year, end mm -hmm. of last year, of the of the Church of Rwanda, and. Uh, Laurent Mabanda, the primate, uh, his five-year term ends sometime this summer, and he's, he will be 67. Re mandatory retirement in Rwanda is 70, and the House of Bishops have voted to extend his term until he reaches 70. And the statement came, and it was a unanimous vote by the House of Bishops, and basically, he's doing a good job we're going through a transition period we're building university we're in the process of rebuilding from the genocide maybe the next level of leadership is quite ready to step in but let's not the church is working after a long time of being broken let's not mess it up and the thing about laurent mabamba he's right on the social and ethical issues but he's also right on in being a complete christian it's what we saw with the problem with Standy and the Gali and the, 
the opprobrium heaped on the Archbishop of Uganda, Stephen uh, Kazimba. Uh, Stanley has always been right on the big issues, but he was engaged in adultery. Uh, and Stephen Kazimba basically said, I'm sorry, just because you're right on this, we're not going to excuse that. We're not going to basically allow, uh, give you a pass because you've been so good here, but allow you to be unfaithful to your wife and to have, have allegedly fathered a child on another woman. That level, I guess what I'm trying to say is, sometimes traditionalists in the Anglican world have made common cause with allies who they may share one thing with but they don't share a deeper thing with and when you're aligned with people who dislike homosexuality not because of its biblical basis but because our culture says it's awful you get yourself in a problem there because you're making the culture the guide rather than scripture so scriptures you know words of how we treat women how we understand human sexuality how we is you know we're to love each other and my brother my, be my brother's keeper if you have that as your guide that's very different from saying homosexuality is bad we can treat women like dirt um those you know we make we get into big trouble when we try to link politically those things well culture changes scripture doesn't Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the problems when you make culture your God and uh, culture your guide and, and culture y your leader in all things. As culture kind of ebbs and flows, and we, we talked about the pendulum before, uh, that causes chaos. In scripture, in reason, in experience, uh, we find uh, something that doesn't change with the winds. And... Uh, that's where there's the consistency of church, there's the consistency of scripture, and certainly the consistency of, uh, of reason. Um, so, I think we've, we, we've it, certainly, yeah, you got something else? Well, there, we've got a tangent that flo flows along this line. Okay. We, report, we reported at the end of last year about Megan Rohr, R-O-H-R-E-R, so however you yeah. pronounce that, Rohr. Rohr, Rohr. That's right. Megan is the E.L. Evangelical Lutheran Church of a Bishop for Northern California, Nevada. She's also the first transgender bishop. Um, I don't ask that many questions about what that exactly means. <laughs> well, she, she dresses she, like like a like she rides a Harley. Well, you know. So, oh, Kevin, my wife will start kicking me under the table right now if I just go down that line. <laughs> Uh, but so I'll be good. She is, she was celebrated as being the first transgender bishop of any main mainline denomination. Mm -hmm. However, the recently she's been in the news because the LG um, I forget its name. Uh, the Lutheran got a, uh, integrity version of Lutheran. What is that? Yeah, I'll mm. pull it up. It's it's uh, it's pop. It, it's coming. It's coming. Um, it'll come. Oh, what was uh, ch -ch 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 extraordinary Lutheran ministry? There you go. All right. That ELM is mm -hmm. was its name. Sorry, folks. I should have these on the tip of my tongue. No, 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 no. This is this is Friday. Yeah. ELM Ministries, which is a coalition of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, of which Megan was a leading member, have kicked her out of the group. We now have war, and she was allegedly kicked out for racism, for, veg uh, for as acting as a bishop, uh, or maybe it was before she was a bishop, but basically disciplining an incompetent gay uh, Hispanic man uh, in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And now the transgender people are at war with the gays and lesbians in the Lutheran Church. The uh, Saturn is eating his children here. Uh, the, <laughs> well, she uh, did have enough the, uh, homogeny. You know, she uh, she was isn't she white? 
She's white. So she's an she's oppressor. From, you know. She's an oppressor, and she's now a man. So she's an oppressor. <laughs> she's she's and, a man now, so she's an oppressor. She she walked right into being the super duper oppressor. And now the, it it just I don't want to say poetic justice, but you know, it's just funny that these these groups keep dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. So they're going to drop the T from LGBT because the transgenders and the gays and lesbians don't have a common agenda. Well, that's, it, but that's been true, and I really recognize this like the last three years, how the lesbians have been at war with the transgendered. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of good podcasts out there that talk about this, and sometimes the news articles make a little bit of mainstream news, uh, about this, certainly you know, J.K. Rowling, who's not lesbian, uh, talks uh, about the, the folly of reason behind transgenderism. Um, but, you know, they're not all at one in, in their thought and their reason and their, um, their polity on how they're going to handle issues and who is one of them. Clearly, a white male oppressor is not going to be uh, welcome in their midst. And it, it's funny to see a bishop walk into this. So, uh, but that's not the only LGBTQ plus 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 plus, comma 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 dot 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 news we have. Uh, Justin Welby took some time out of his busy schedule planning the next Lambeth to have a Zoom conference with um, the LGBTQ plus 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 bishops in the Anglican Communion, whom I'm I'm pretty sure you thought there's probably one or two. There happens to be a little bit more. There's enough to fill a Zoom screen, George. The five of them who were on a uh, uh, Zoom call, uh, and the three from the Episcopal Church of the United States, the Bishop of Maine, the Bishop of uh, Missouri, the Suffragan Bishop of New York, plus a Canadian Bishop, plus Cherry Van, the Bishop of Monmouth and the Church of Wales. Mm -hmm. There also could have been uh, two English bishops, so, uh, both of whom are suffragans, who are partnered, plus uh, some the number of unpartnered English bishops, but they're still keeping that under the under the uh, radar, so to speak. Well, they had a Zoom meeting because they're mad because Justin Welby is not allowed their, allowing their spouses to come to Lambeth. And the meeting was private, so we don't have any official readout from it, though some of the bishops who participated have released statements, and there's a story in the Episcopal News Service, which we're going to reprint on Anglican Inc. And Welby has gone out of his... He's not changed his gay spouse's line, but by the same token, he is basically being as welcoming and as accommodating and being as supportive of them and their ministries and what they stand for as he possibly can be. Now this follows this, if you will, gay summit that Welby's holding, mm -hmm. follows Welby's appointment of a man who is in the same position as these bishops, uh, except he has a, well, the Canadian bishop is legally married in Toronto, uh, but he's a partnered gay man who is now the man in charge of selecting the Church of England's bishops. So how is Welby possibly going to be deliver any sort of balance when he is kowtowing to the small group of gay bishops? He's appointing a gay activist to be in charge of the selection process. And meanwhile, Rod Thomas, the flying evangelical Bishop of Maidstone, doesn't mean he flies around in a helicopter, but <laughs> his, his jurisdiction is non-geographic under suffragan authority. Uh, how Julian Mann had an article which he wrote for us, mm -hmm. where basically the conservative evangelicals are not optimistic that they're going to get a real suffragan bishop who will be one of them in thought and in belief. They may just get another, you know, Welby calls himself an evangelical, and he thinks he's an evangelical. The evangelicals don't think he's an evangelical, but that doesn't matter, because Welby thinks he's an evangelical. I bet he thinks he's being multi-flourishing, uh, uh, um, too. What's a word to use? Um, Mutual flourishing. Mutual flourishing. I bet he thinks that he's honoring that as well.
you know and it, it's crazy to watch that so the uh, you know Julian Mann's article basically points out that uh, Rod Thomas uh, was has been on this LFF or LLF or whatever it is living in faith and fullness and whatever task force which is to basically uh, give the Church of England its steering on the gay issue but the tracks have been laid down where this is going so all the talk that Rod Thomas and Rod Thomas has basically has been in the caboose of this train trying to slow it down when the engine and the tracks are all uh, the tracks are laid to speed towards a conclusion and the engine is full speed ahead in one answer which is gay blessings so what do conservative evangelicals do this is very hard for them um the uh well and and let, let, let's be uh, let me i'm gonna be very honest i think it's hypocritical not to invite the spouses if you're going to entertain any of it you need to entertain all of it otherwise you're just being very hypocritical and so that, that that's kevin's statement if you're going to take an inch, take the whole ruler, okay? So Remember in uh, was it 98, Justin mm -hmm. Welby didn't invite uh, Gene Robinson. Correct. Gene, uh, not Justin Gene Welby. Robinson. That was Rowan Williams, uh, wasn't it? Rowan Williams. Yeah. No, George Carey. Or was yeah. it 2008? Two, yeah, We're getting old, Kevin. Oh, my gosh. In 2008, 2008, Gene Robbins wasn't invited to Lambeth. I think I he was did. still in England, but, you know. He was invited, and he was in the exhibitor's tent giving out uh, books and pamphlets and whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they made it big to do about not inviting Nolbert Canunga, mm -hmm. the crooked bishop of Harare. Well, there were about a dozen Indian bishops at that time under active criminal complaint for being just as much of a crook as Nolbert Canunga, but that hadn't made the papers in the UK, so they all could come, while Nolbert Canunga, being a bad guy, was rightfully exclude it um so yes in a sense it is hypocritical because there's not an equal we're going to see at the lambeth conference next this year if we still hold it with the covid flare-ups we're going to see crooked bishops when i mean crooked bishops i mean bishops who steal from their diocese who sell church properties who are an active under active criminal investigation we're going to see those guys welcomed with open arms and treated no differently from bishops who are leading churches in places of severe persecution and are under constant threat of martyrdom. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no real discernment being exercised uh, here. Nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, it would be you know, poetic justice or uh, just God's revelation if the, the next outbreak of coronavirus was named Lambda and it canceled Lambeth that'd be really cool I, I I would I would find that just super miraculously awesome but we'll see what happens well, uh do we have any other but, yeah well we do have uh actor pa Pakistani mm -hmm. blasphemy at the the Acne bishops met this week in Melbourne Florida mm -hmm. and publicly they've announced the approval of the election of the Anik Anik they don't Anik. like people. we don't they don't like us to say <laughs> Anik. They want it to be Anik. We're sorry. <laughs> Mea culpa. I've made a mistake yeah. for many years. Anik. Like anecdote, mm -hmm. not Anik. The Anik bishop mm -hmm. to succeed Charlie Masters was approved. And the Bishop of South Carolina to succeed Mark Lawrence was approved by the House of Bishops. So they've taken their seats in the College of Bishops, excuse me. College mm -hmm. of Bishops. The Anglican Church in North America. Charlie Masters has released a little uh, video of what they've talked about to date at the meeting. Not anything that extraordinary. Um, what they're not talking about publicly, but what we think they're talking about, uh, is I think the situation in the upper Midwest. Oh, absolutely. Is a major concern. And certainly we're talking and, about uh, some of the bishops who've been more vocal about. Uh, uh, introducing wokenism into their diocese in critical race theory that was a topic last time they had a meeting and it's certainly something they're going to have to really decide whether or not they're going to issue a statement on 
and there has never been a follow-up publicly about their statement on race. I remember they put a little commission together of some uh, clergy that included some uh, notables. Uh, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. They actually put together a multi-page statement on what the ACNA should do and think and reflect on race relations. It never became public, and I think uh, that's something that needs to be made public. Maybe somebody should leak it or something. Who knows? So uh, that's the ACNA. There's an important Pakistani story we should talk about, too, because this is, this is what uh, Christian persecution really looks like in the Middle East. Christian persecution really shouldn't be claimed when your spouse is same-sex spouse is not invited to a conference with you. Christian persecution is what happens to a minister in India. Uh, this man is a Christian minister, Protestant minister, uh, was arrested in 2012 for on the crime of blasphemy. He, it was claimed he sent text messages, SMS messages that denigrated the prophet Muhammad. Well, his lawyers pointed out that the that the SIM card that sent these messages uh, that that it was the origin from was not registered to him. It had no connection to him. He didn't do it. That didn't matter. It was claimed it, 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 by. In fact, the owner of that SIM card said, "Yes, this is my SIM card," and she was able to negotiate, you know, make a plea deal. However, this fellow had uh, opponents in his community who were angry that his he was preaching the gospel and helping Christians stand against, uh, it was a property dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, evidently, uh, some Christian missionaries 100 years ago bought this land for poor Christians to farm and the land has been handed down over the generations. Some wealthy Muslim property owners in the area have wanted this land and to enclose their fields and properties. And this minister was helping the local Christians maintain their property rights, maintain the legal deeds and records. He was accused of blasphemy, falsely, as Kevin has said, and has been held in jail since 2012. And finally his trial was held and he was found guilty and he's been sentenced to death. This is Christian persecution. This, this is, you know, not getting not getting the invitation you want is not persecution death for for being an advocate for your people for being a good priest a good minister that's christian persecution absolutely absolutely all right that's all the news for today let's let's cover a couple things okay some people have been been complaining about the slurp I'm sorry. I, I I should be drinking less on air, and I will reduce. No, no, no. Yes, I will reduce yeah, the syrup. Some yeah. people have been complaining to me <laughs> to <laughs> tell <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> friends, I am not Kevin's wife. If you want to complain, She's go right. to the source. Don't tell me to tell Kevin because so I you will. Know, that's not my. Yeah. I said at the beginning of the show, we love our audience. You guys are the greatest audience. I will slurp less for you. As for the time code I put at the bottom, the indexing, that's based on time. If I have extra 20 minutes so I'm editing or half hour, I'll go through and put the time code in the bottom so you can have an index of where the stories are. If you don't see it, it's because I didn't have the time to put the time code in. And I'm sorry, uh, George and I live busy lives, although my wife thinks I don't do anything. So it, in as such, if you see the time code, it means I had a little extra time to edit the show. And uh, I think that's all the announcements. We are up to one hour. Kevin, Kevin yep. ask Jill just to pop her head up so she could, people at yep. home can have the fun that we have. Jill? What? Can you stand up quick? Why? Just stand up and wave. What? Just stand up. I'm standing up. <laughs> we can't see you. You're off camera. Move to the to the left a little. There you go. That's my wife there, at work. Now oh, wave. wave, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> And I'm George Conger, and you have been watching episode 712 of Anglican Unscripted.